15 years. He has um, a bachelor's degree in environmental policy from BGSU with an emphasis in habitat restoration. Um, she currently lives in Bowling Green with her husband and two curious kiddos, and they enjoy gardening together, bike riding, reading, crafting, and exploring the nearby Black Swamp. And um, Larray, I will turn it over to you. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, one of the things I did want to just kind of let everyone know, because I know you guys will be excited about this, is tomorrow... Um, Scott Carpenter and I are going to Columbus to, um, because um, they have chosen um, the Toledo area as one of our um, national um, native plant learning centers. So we're going to um, go there tomorrow, kind of learn more about what that means and um, see how we can develop that learning center in one of our metro parks. So we're excited about that. We get to do some cool field trips along the way and um, just kind of see what that's going to be about and bring that back to Toledo area. Um, but today <laughs> I'm going to be talking about um, one of the um, unfortunate forest pathogens that we have um, in our metro parks and in the Oak Openings region and what Metro Parks is doing to help manage that um, pathogen. And the pathogen is oak wilt. Why is my, sorry, my buttons aren't working. There we go. So Oakwell is a, it's a fungal pathogen. Um, the fungus is um, Ceratisosis uh, fugaciarum. Um, and, and what it is, is it's a vascular disease. So um, it, it gets into the back, vascular system of an oak tree and it actually clogs that system so that the vascular system can no longer transport food and water. Um, and that clog can happen relatively quickly. There is a, a debate on whether or not oak wilt is native or non-native. Um, if you look at the genetics of oak wilt, it seems genetically, it seems like it's non-native because it's because it's not very genetically diverse. So if something were to um, be in a region for a long, long time, then the, it would go to say that it would become more and more genetically diverse. But because if something is recently introduced, um, it would have little genetic variability. So that's one of the reasons that they feel like oak wilt is non-native. However, we don't have a, we don't know where it came from. So so we don't have um, any good, like they don't, they don't see it anywhere else in the world currently, except for in North America. So there is debate as to whether it is native or non-native. Um, part of that debate too is because it does, um, it did kind of originate where we have traditional oak savannas. So um, it's, because of that, there is this kind of debate of whether or not it was, it was kind of one of our original oak savanna creators. So did it help um, with the evolution and the development of the oak savanna habitat um, historically? So, um, but nonetheless, it is destru very destructive to any kind of oak dominated um, habitat, oak dominated woodlands, um, and Metro Parks is definitely because we have that in the Oak Openings region, we are managing um, to protect our oak trees. So the species, it, um, it is not, it'll, it will affect or attack any kind of oak tree. So there's no oak tree that we know of that is not susceptible to um, oak wilt, so it will attack anything in the red oak family. Um, the red oak family trees are really susceptible. So anything in the red oak family, if it becomes infected, it can um, easily die within three weeks. So after infection, it stops that transport of, of fluids pretty immediately, and then the tree dies, the entire, the entire tree. Um, the other thing about the red oaks is it's also easier for it to spread from tree to tree. Um, the fungus doesn't live well once the tree is dead. 
so it's quickly trying to move to a new tree and the red oak family tends to root graft so the the fungus can actually travel underground through those root grafts. So the other, the other um, oak species are the white oak family. And again, um, the white oak family is still, still has a high mortality rate if it does become infected. The difference is it might take like three-ish years. Um, oak or white oak trees have tyloses in their um, sapwood. And that just kind of, it creates compartments in their sapwood so that they, they don't become as clogged as quickly. Um, but eventually the entire tree will die. Um, the, the good thing about the white oak um, also is that they don't tend to root graft like the red oaks do. So even if a white oak tree is infected, hypothetically, the tree next to it is not gonna become infected through that underground spread. So it is a little bit easier to stop the spread in the white oak if your white oak trees are infected. So this was the distribution of oak wilt in 2016 throughout the United States. Um, you can see it kind of did start in the Midwestern um, states, which again are the states where the oak savannas are more, more prevalent. So this right here, this slide just shows us the disease cycle. Um, oak wilt is actually a a, it's a short-lived fungus, so it doesn't survive in the soil for very long or in the tree for very long um, unless it has living tissue to live on. So because of this, it actually can be relatively easy to break that cycle. Um, but what you want to do is really prevent that overland spread. So if you look at the top of this graph, that represents the actual overland spread. So what it does is um, there are beetles, they're called picnic beetles or nutitolid beetles that come out in, um, in the spring. So maybe April through July is when those are most active, these beetles. And what they're doing is they're picnic beetles are looking for sweet, the sweet sap or so the wounds of trees will oftentimes have that sweet sap. So that's what they're looking for to feed on. So what happens is in the spring, the um, Four mats that might pr be produced in a oak tree that that is infected with the the oak wilt um, has a really really sweet smell and we actually very rarely have we seen the the spore mats but we actually did see some spore mats this spring at Wildwood and it really did smell like fermenting wine or something like that it was very pungent and very sweet um, so they're attracted to that sweet smell so once they are attracted to those fungal spores, then they can spread those spores to other trees because then they're also attracted to the wounds of those other trees. So they can go to a spore mat and then travel to the wound of another tree and then that tree can become infected with oak wilt. And so then that whole process then can continue the next, the following spring after the tree dies, the tree will die within like three weeks, the following spring or occasionally in the fall, if it's a really wet fall, four mats could be produced again and then the nutitolid beetles would again be attracted to those four mats. Now the cycle underground is simply the tree dies. Um, if it is grafted with another tree, again because the fungus doesn't live very long, um, unless it has live tissue, the fungus quickly moves on to find that live tissue, and then it will affect another grafted tree. And then the tree dies and then moves on along again underground. So basically, so those are the different methods of spread. So you basically you have the above ground spread and the below ground spread. So in order to effectively manage oak wilt, you have to make sure that you are ma managing both of those types of spread. This is the, a picture of the root grafting. You can kind of see how in the photo, how the red, red oak trees can root graft. And so one of the things about the red oaks too is in these, these um, high density oak, oak forests, like are what we have in the oak openings region, 
um, these trees are connected. And especially someplace, if you guys go to Wildwood, next time you go to Wildwood, really look around and see how many white oak trees you can find. There's, there are not a lot. So in, in large portions of our oak woodland, the red oak family really is dominant. So we can expect that there's a lot of root grafting. And then the other thing is um, roots are more likely to graft if they have these sandy soils, which again, in the oak openings region are our dominant soils. So these are what the oak wilt symptoms would look like. And you would be seeing these now in, in your neighborhoods or in our natural habitat. Um, so usually the symptoms start to show in July and you'll continue to see um, different trees getting the disease through September. So through this, the end of the season kind of active, but it's still this active growing, growing time. Um, so what happens is the trees, the leaves will turn this kind of like coppery. It's a coppery brown color. And typically they don't really curl up. Usually the entire, if it's a red oak, the entire tree will start to turn all at the same time, um, pretty much. Sometimes it'll start at the tips and move its way down. Um, but basically the entire tree will look dead pretty instantly, just like the picture that you see on the right. And it could literally look like it happens overnight. You might notice like, all of a sudden you'll wake up and realize that your tree is dead and you will maybe not have even noticed that it was happening. And then oftentimes what happens is the leaves just fall. So if you're walking in a, in the, in a habitat and you see a lot of dead leaves on the fall, but they're not curled up because they, they don't even have time to really dry up on the tree. They just die and oftentimes just senesce and, and fall to the ground. Um, now a white oak tree will look a little bit different because the entire tree doesn't die at the same time, but maybe a third of the tree will suddenly die. So the death is usually still sudden, the death that occurs, um, but it might only be on one third of the tree. So, you know, a, you know, three or four branches will die and the rest of the tree will look pretty healthy. The other symptoms are those spore mats. So if you look at the photo, you can kind of see how there's some streaking or kind of some cracking in the bark. And then what will happen in the kind of in the center of that cracking, it'll start to push out. And if you pull that back, you'll see these black spore mats underneath the bark. And then typically you would not see um, you know, any kind of beetle damage or anything like that because the tree would will have been perfectly healthy. So that's one of the saddest things when we do our oak wilt management is oftentimes these are perfectly healthy trees that had no symptoms of um, any kind, any kind of other, other thing that was harming it, any kind of disease or any kind of insect damage, and then all of a sudden the trees die. So usually um, there isn't a lot of insect damage if you do look underneath the bark. Um, so the, but it's the pressure from the um, spores being produced or that mat being produced that pushes the, the bark out. And again, those spore mats are not going to be typically created until the following year. So a tree will die and it will be the following spring that the spore mats will be created. And, I, and also occasionally in the fall after the death, but only if there was maybe a lot of rain. So basically then we know that we have these, these, um, this above ground spread and we know we have this below ground spread. Did I get, yeah. So there are different things that we can do. There's different types of, of management options. And one of the management options um, is to prevent the, the below ground spread. And I shouldn't say one, this is part of the management options. Because again, unless you're managing both, um, it's gonna be really, really difficult to stop a disease epicenter. Um, so one of the ways to manage the below ground spread is with this vibratory plow that you see in this photo. And this is just, it's a big blade and they use this to lay fiber op optics. So last year, this is something that we have to rent um, it was actually really difficult to get one last year because um, everyone was scrambling with all of the Zoom meetings 
that everyone was having in schools um, to get a lot more fiber optic cable put into the ground. So it was hard for us to find um, one of these machines to rent. Um, but basically it's just something they, they use to lay fiber. So this blade goes into the ground and then it just vibrates along. So it's not going up and down, up and down. It's not really turning the soil. It's not digging anything. It's not really trenching anything. It's just kind of vibrating along. And then as it pulls along, it just severs the roots. So it's really, really very surgical. Um, and it, it does very little damage to the, the surrounding habitat. Um, another thing that can be effective that people have done is actually to cut the tree down and then pull out the entire stump. So by pulling out the stump, you're, you're severing the root grafting to any tree that might be um, right next to it. Um, and then there's also chemical root disrupt disruption, which we would not recommend um, because that would damage the surrounding soil, the soil microbes. Um, another thing that you can do to prevent spread is to actually inject um, a tree with a fungicide. Uh, which is very expensive. I shouldn't say very expensive. It's very expensive if you're do, trying to do it in a habitat. Um, but if you're trying to protect, protect a couple of really nice oak trees in your yard, I would say it's probably worth it if you know that you have infection in the area. Um, so we do um, some fungicides in, in Wildwood Preserve. We're looking at doing some fungicide treatments at Toledo Botanical Gardens. Um, so if you have a tree that is just highly valued, then it would definitely be worth it to look into using a fungicide to protect the tree from oak wool. Um, again, though, this is kind of a prevention. Um, a white oak, you could, if, if, it, if a third of the tree died and it, and it already had the disease, you could still use the fungicide, although you've lost the third of the tree, but if you see a black oak that has been infected, the tree's already dead. Once you see that infection, the tree's already dead, so you would not be able to protect a black oak tree after infection with a bunch of eyes. And then the other thing that will stop the underground spread is just the barrier of something that's not oak. So it could be um, any kind of natural barrier that's not oak. It could be um, roadways. It could be an agricultural field. Um, in urban areas, you know, you just might have sections of town that don't have a lot of oak trees or in, an, in any kind of um, woodland habitat. If you get into a woodland that's predominantly maple or another species, then that would stop the disease underground. And then the next part of the treatment is to make sure that you're also controlling that overland spread. And controlling the overland spread means basically that you have to remove um, all of the mass of the tree that is under a six inch DBH. So that anything that's over a six inch DBH, if it has that much tissue, um, hypothetically, it can create a spore mat. So it's enough tissue to create a spore mat. So you need to reduce that tissue down so that it can't create that spore mat. So it could be, um, and this just has to happen before the, the following spring after death. So it could be you're chipping the whole tree up. If you can burn the entire tree um, through the winter, then that would be a way to get rid of it. Um, some other things that you can do is you can actually tarp it. So if you protect it from the new titillid be beetles so that the beetles can't get in, um, that would that would prevent any overland spread. Um, so just making sure you're getting rid of that biomass that could actually create a spore mat. So even if you cut the tree down, if that dead tree is laying on the ground, it can still create a spore mat. Um, and then the other thing that's really important is trying our hardest to make sure that we're not damaging oak trees during the growing season. Um, there's nothing we can do about storms and stuff like that, but um, what we can do is make sure that we're not pruning our oak trees um, between April and October. Um, this is really critical because if you create that wound, a nutitolid beetle can be attracted to that wound and then spread oak wilt to your oak tree. 
So um, going back to Wildwood Preserve and just looking at the oak wilt management at Metro Park, um, we believe that it was first observed in the 1990s. So we have some documentation. Um, I believe, I'm sure Denise Gehring um, may have been, you know, part of that documentation, but we have documentation that it was here then. And at that point, several trees were cut and removed, and then there was no existing re record of any kind of follow-up. And then in 2013, staff noticed a lot of more dying oaks um, at, at Wildwood. OSU extension came and did some testing and it did test positive for oak wilt. So then after that, we decided, okay, it's time for us to take action, knowing um, the value of the oak trees at Wildwood Preserve. Um, so we decided, well, the first year we actually did all of our monitoring on the ground, which was um, really time consuming and difficult. Um, and then the second year, we decided to use uh, a helicopter for aerial, aerial monitoring, which was far a lot easier. So on the right, you can see how easy it is to detect oak, oak wilt from the air um, during this time frame. Usually it's August. So right now is, is when I'm talking to the helicopter pilot, trying to get a date so that we can get out um, and look at the oak openings region from the air. And the really cool thing about doing it from the air um, is it's really economical because we can do the entire um, oak openings region in Metro Parks, the Metro Parks oak openings region in four, less than four hours really, but in four hours from the air. From the air, you can get in a picture of the entire oak openings region in the Metro Parks. And we also look at some of the surrounding areas too. So we'll look at um, Kitty Todd Preserve and kind of report to them what we see. We'll look at State Preserve and we'll look at Irwin Prairie and just, you know, any anything else that we see, we'll make sure that we report um, to any other agency that we feel like um, it could be important. Um, and then we also then make sure that uh, if we see anything concerning that we would let Amy Stone um, at the Extension Office know. So this is after that first year that we did um, those mo the monitoring at Wildwood Preserve, um, we had decisions to make as far as what we were gonna do. So this map kind of shows us the no, no action map. This is what we call our no action map. So if we were to do nothing um, within 20 years, we would have expected oak wilt to expand as you can see in the yellow. So after 10 years, it would have covered about 55 acres. And after 20 years, the expectation would have been that it would have covered 107 acres. Um, so one of the things, even though talking about this, is you can see that oak wilt, um, although devastating, doesn't move really fast. So it's nothing like when emerald ash borer came through and we lost all of our ash trees easily within three years probably. Um, so it's not like that, although when you have an oak dominated forest like this, it's difficult to stop because you don't have those non-oak barriers to really stop the spread easily. So this would have been if we decided to do nothing. And then the other treatments to consider are what we call cut to the line treatments or monitor and remove. So cut to the line treatment would be, you have an infected oak tree um, as your epicenter, and then you go out anywhere between 50 to 100 feet from that infected tree. And, and that just depends on the size. So if it was a 75 foot tall, um, or not tall, sorry, if it was like a, a 38 inch DBH oak tree, you might go out 100 feet. If it's only a 12 inch DBH oak tree, you might only go out 50 feet. Um, so basically you go out 50 feet, you create a line around that tree and cut to the line would mean all the oak trees within that perimeter, you would remove all of them, whether they were dead or not. So the idea there is you are reducing the ability for it to have that underground spread. And then monitor and remove would be, you create that perimeter 
Um, and then you also, so the perimeter is created with that trench, that vibratory plow. So you create that vibratory plow perimeter, plow perimeter, sorry. And then you can create a bunch of other, other perimeters within too. So like, if you look at this picture, you can see the outside is the primary, that's the primary line. And then in the middle, there's a secondary line that's pink. And then there's some other little lines that are called isolation lines. And that might be, okay, there's a really healthy tree here. We're gonna try to isolate that too. So the monitor and remove gives you at least some options to potentially protect some of the trees that are within that, that perimeter. And the idea of the perimeter is, the, is that it's quite possible, especially if it's a, black oak or white oak, or sorry, if it's in the red oak family, that that tree is root grafted with it um, to any tree within that 100 feet or 50 feet, you know, whatever is determined, um, the number of feet ne are determined necessary um, to, control, to control the underground spread. So this is, so that first year that we did the trenching, this is what our trenching looked like at Oak Openings Preserve, or it's an example of one of our trench lines. So we did some primary lines and then we had some of the yellow or kind of some of the secondary lines that we had where we were trying to isolate different trees that we felt were um, important to isolate. So then the other component of determining how we're gonna do or how we're gonna manage is that we had to come up with a bigger management management plan. So it wasn't enough just to say, okay, we're going to reduce the spread by doing all of the underground um, root disruption. So we know that we need to monitor and this has to happen um, annually. So annually we do the monitoring. After that, we have to go out and do the ground truthing. And we do try to, try to also do some diagnostic samplings that we send to OSU. Um, we do then the root, so then we have to you know, part of the plan is that prevention and reducing the spread, and then education, um, potentially tree injections if we feel like we have these highly valued trees, um, making sure that we have that pruning ban, which here says April to August, um, but we've really been trying to push that all the way through October, um, just to be safe. And then, um, having that restoration plan. So as we're removing these trees, what should our restoration plan be? Um, we know that we need to do potentially invasive control because we're, you know, we have more sunlight coming to the forest floor. Um, but the other question is, do we want to do reforestation? And part of answering those questions for us is the research component. So we are currently doing research at Metro Parks um, to help us answer those questions. So again, this is just goes over the trenching and how we're severing the roots. Um, this has to be done before we actually remove any of the trees. And this is typically done, it can be done August through November, but at Metro Parks, we very rarely get to it until about November. Um, we have to, so, you know, you go out and you figure out where all of these, these potential oak wilt infested areas are. Then we have to go ground truth it after ground truthing. Then we have to actually put in, um, like mark the trench lines and then prep the trench lines. So by the time we do all of that, um, it's usually well into November before we're actually ready to rent this plow. So when we're ready to rent the plow, we wanna be able to go. So the trench lines have to be prepped. Um, we wanna be able to move from site to site really quickly without any problems. Um, at Metro Parks, we are using these primary and secondary lines. So we do that primary line on the outside. Oftentimes we'll do a complete secondary line around the infected tree if there's only one. Um, and we use a lot of isolation lines so that we're isolating what look like, at least for now, healthy trees. And what we're finding is that the trenching is about 80% effective at isolating um, these infestations. And it feels like the only time they're not effective um, is when it's just the topography of the land makes it difficult for us to do a complete uh, primary line all the way around the infestation area. So if we run into like at Wildwood, Wildwood, 
when we run into the um, Swan Creek floodplain or any of the the headwaters to the floodplain, um, when we run into those types of topography, we can't get all the way around the the infected area. So sometimes I think that is primarily what allows allows the infestation to jump those plow lines. Um, sometimes we maybe can't quite get a full 50 feet away or 75 feet away, like maybe we can't quite make that minimum distance because of private property. Um, so then the, the tree is able to get around or the infestation is able to get around because of that. And then we do have to retrench um, about every five years because these trees will regraft. Um, so making sure we're doing all that retrenching is critical. And then at Metro Parks, um, after the trenching, we do do sanitation. And this is extremely time consuming. Um, we do it in a lot of different ways. Um, if we're able to, we just chip the trees up because sometimes that's just the easiest way to do it. We don't produce any firewood or rely in any way on the idea that some of this could get burned as firewood because what we don't want is, A, we don't want to be spreading it around. So we try as often as we can to, to um, ship it up on site. Um, and then we just don't want the firewood sitting somewhere because then we would have to monitor it and make sure it's actually getting burned. And that could become just kind of a logistic nightmare to try to make, to make sure mo that monitoring is happening. Um, the other thing that we do often is we do have an agreement with a mill so we can take our our products to a mill. Um, and as long as he's taking off that, it's really that sapwood, right, that needs to be removed and chipped up. So um, he removes all of that and we go and we chip up everything that he puts into that bin. Um, so that some of these logs, because again, like I said, these are, a lot of these are beautiful trees. They were healthy trees. There was nothing um, infecting them until beautiful wood. And it always just feels like it's such a shame to, to um, just chip it all into little one inch chips. Um, so occasionally, if we, if we know our construction crew needs a white oak beam or something like that, we'll make sure that we can utilize that. We have done some tarping. Um, in areas that are really isolated that we just can't get equipment to easily. Um, the tarping was difficult also. We had a lot of problems. We're not sure if it was with vandals or not, but we just had a lot of problems with slip, um, splits in the tarp. So it was really difficult for us to manage that tarp and make sure that it actually stayed tight um, and that it, you know, think that it couldn't open up. So then the component again is just that educational component. So making sure that we stop Oakwell is a community effort um, and we need to make sure that we are involving the community. Um, we tried to, so this, this fall, we did a Metro Parks meetup um, on 13AC. So they came out a couple of times actually and did some Oakwell, Oakwell um, articles for us making sure that we're collaborating with others. So we do trenching for, um, we've done some tre trenching for the city of Sylvania or for um, TOPS. Um, we've also done trenching at, uh, for the state at their Milky Road Savannah, help some others. We can't do a lot with private landowners. Um, but we, I mean, beyond co consult, which we're happy to do, um, but we, we have been trying to collaborate in these natural areas as much as we can. Um, and then really just um, making sure that people know about the proper pruning and tree removal. Um, so if we see, when we talk to contractors, one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to when we use contractors is, you know, how do they treat an oak tree? Would they even think about pruning an oak tree 
in August or in July. Um, do they spike their trees? So if a tree, a person is climbing a tree, are they going to use spikes? Um, and the other thing is collateral damage is not okay. So it's not okay when they're removing a maple tree to accidentally damage a nearby oak tree. So you know, does that contractor care about any kind of collateral damage that they might do to a nearby tree? Um, so those are things that we do at Metro Parks is we, we make sure we <laughs> basically kind of give them our oak, you know, their oak interviews kind of um, to see what they say about oak trees and to just got to get a sense of whether or not they're aware of all of the oak wilt issues. And not only are, are they aware, most of them honestly are pretty aware, um, but are they actually following the protocol? So that's um, really important to us. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, if we see people that are not doing it properly. So if you know that your city arborists or something like that are not trimming properly, we need to be making sure that we're calling our cities um, and even reporting an arborist. If you see a, a private ar arborist, you know, you can, you could call that company and make sure that they understand oak wilt protocols. If you see this in your neighborhood and you have oak trees that you're trying to protect, um, making sure that the arborists in your neighborhood are following these oak wilt protocols is really critical. And then again, the other thing that we can do is protect our highly valued trees. So if we if we feel like we need to do those fungicide injections, um, making sure that we're doing those so that we can protect those trees. So the restoration and research. So um, what we're doing right now is we're working with Scott Abella, um, who's doing a lot of research for us in the Oak Openings region. He is a professor at the University of Las Vegas, but he's been spending his summers with us. Um, and he's a Sylvania, a, a, um, is from Sylvania originally. So, and he did his graduate um, work in the Oak Openings region. So he has some heartstrings here for sure. Um, so he's been doing a lot of our, our research in the Oak Oak, or in the Oakwell areas. And right now his research is primarily looking at um, the vegetative, response to these oak well, these open openings. So what's what's happening vegetatively? He's not doing a lot of research yet on the effectiveness of our treatments, which is kind of our next step. Um, and it's something that in the oak well community throughout the United States, people are really looking for. I think a lot of people that do oak wilt um, management are looking for something new. Um, because we know that there are other um, management tools that we need in order to stop this spread. So looking at you know, what other management tools could we be using that might help. Um, so again, invasive control in the openings is part of our restoration plan. Um, and then the other question as far as the revegetation is, do we allow it? Do we allow the open? Oh, the openings because it is oak openings. So essentially oak wilt is creating these oak savannas. Um, there have been, you know, researchers and um, land managers in the Midwest that have actually introduced oak wilt to areas that were historically oak openings type habitats or oak savannas. Um, to help them do oak savanna restoration. The, the thing that breaks my heart about oak wilt, because I love oak, I love opening, <laughs> um, is that it's just not selective. So it will kill your old, the biggest, oldest oak tree that you have out there. It can easily kill. Um, so then the other question is just kind of what else? What can we do? Can we, what, what kinds of effects might, might fire have? on oak wilt. Um, double trench lines is something that people are starting to really look into. So instead of just doing that primary, one primary line, right next to that primary line, you would do a second line that's only like a foot away from it kind of thing. So basically you're widening that primary line. And then the other thing is the clear cut. If we know, especially in oak openings preserve potentially, or in um, the, in areas 
like in, out in our corridor that we know are prime oak openings or oak savanna habitats, um, would it be more beneficial for us to just do a clear cut and would we be able to stop the spread more quickly if we have a small infestation and just do a clear cut along with the root disruption. If we do the root disruption and a clear cut, could we stop it? Sorry, the battery is low. So what is the current status of oak wilt? So originally in 2013 and 2014, we were only doing oak wilt in um, wildwood. And it wasn't until last year, um, most of the oak wilt was basically north of airport highway, any oak wilt uh, presence that we were seeing. <coughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> my voice is going now. <laughs> um, and now, <clears throat> now we see it out. <clears throat> Sorry, we have it at Toledo Botanical Gardens. <clears throat> in the Oak Openings Corridor and at Oak Openings Preserve. Um, like I said, we've also done it at um, Milky Road Savannah, that's the state's property. And we've done some work at, at um, <clears throat> in Sylvania also. So what we feel like, we feel like we're slowing the spread, but we're not really stopping it. Um, <clears throat> and it's that overland spread. We feel like the trenching is working really well but we still have a lot of that overland spread. Um, and even in our natural areas. So I don't think it's necessarily because of improper pruning. I think it could just be because you have a, if you have a thunderstorm, if you have you know, tree damage because of that, you're creating those wounds. And so you have that likelihood of that overland spread. Um, but knowing that it's slow moving gives us time um, so that we can continue developing and improving our, our methods. So that's the you know light at the end, <coughs> light at the end of the tunnel, is that we know we have <clears throat> unlike um, unlike emerald ash borer, um, we do have time to change our methods and find methods that are hopefully more effective. So some of the um, summary points is just that oak wilt we know is um, significant. And it can certainly change our forest dynamics um, and the dominance of the oaks in our forest. So, you know, in thinking about that, like what does that mean? Uh, should we be focusing more on white oak trees when we do reforestation? Um, should we be focusing a lot more on hickory trees? So that's some of the things that we're looking at too, because they still have a lot of wildlife value, but um, it would give us some of those natural breaks maybe so that we have less of that root root grafting. Um, but the other thing that we do know is that the oak wilt definitely will not only um, affect our forests, but it will affect these urban areas also. Um, this community cooperation is going to be key to the success of a plan. So making sure people know what oak wilt is, making sure people know how it spreads, and what they can do to help stop that spread. So that proper pruning, um, if you are trying to protect a tree, making sure you're using a fungicide on your tree, um, those types of things so that we know um, reporting, again, reporting if you see people that are not doing the proper pruning. And then the other thing that we know is, is critical um, is that sanitation part. So the, the below ground is kind of easy, honestly. I mean, there's a lot of work to get to that point, but it's pretty easy to do. But that above ground um, sanitation is really important because that is what's causing our overhead spread. 
And then again, kind of looking at what kinds of reforestation options should we be considering? So to reforest or not, so maybe, maybe we just let the openings be because it is the oak opening. Um, but if we do want to reforest, we have to make sure that we're doing that in a smart way. So our reforestation, um, this last reforestation project that we did, we made sure that we had the red oaks um, planted far enough apart that hypothetically they wouldn't be able to root graft. So if we're reforesting and we're focusing primarily on that white oak family that can't root graft, and if we do plant things in the red oak family, making sure that they're spread far enough apart that they're less likely to graft. So those are some of the other things that we're just kind of, that we're talking about. Um, and we will be flying soon. So if you see a helicopter flying low in your uh, Metro Park this month, it is probably us doing our oak growth surveys. Um, if anybody has any questions, we, I can answer questions now. My contact info is here. If anybody has any questions, like over the last next month, if you see a tree that suddenly dies um, or have something in your yard that suddenly dies, feel free to contact me too. We'd be happy to kind of help you through that. So Lorraine, we did have um, Kate put in a, the chat about that they recently lost um, approximately a one to two inch diameter limb from an oak during a storm mm -hmm. and she wanted to know if that would be big enough that they but should they cover the wound or is there something that can be done to protect the tree? Um, yeah so so you can get like wound dressing you can buy wound dressing and it's just something that you spray on a wound and I would say yes because all it has to do is get into that vascular system and once it gets into the vascular system it can spread and thrive right that's all the the fungus has to do. So I think no matter how large the wound, um, if you're able to get to it, you know, so unfortunately a lot of wounds are happening way up in the canopy and you just can't get to them. But if you can get to it, it's um, a good idea to have, if you have oak trees, you have some wound spray available, you know, on your shelf in your garage so that you can treat it as soon as possible. Um, and then Randy asked about if Metro Parks volunteers have been involved in, that are involved in the trail maintenance, if they've been trained in proper practices. I don't think so. And that's a good idea, Randy, to make sure that they know how to ID. And you're saying even like pruning. Is that what you're asking? Like when they do the, the pruning along the trails? I can't. Yes, he said yes. yeah. Yeah, prob I'm, I'm not sure because I'm not, in, I haven't been involved in their training. So that's a good, a good point and something I should look, look into. Um, with the fungicide, how often um, does that need to be applied? So it gets applied once a year. Um, and I'm not 100% certain for how long you need to do it. So like, do you have to do it for the indefinitely <laughs> or can you skip a few years? Um, right now where we are, the logo tree at um, Wildwood, we're pretty sure has already been infected. Um, so we are trying to save it still. <laughs> um, so that we've been doing every year. But I'm not 100% certain of how long, like if you would have to do it for 20 years, you know, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like that's not the case because for some reason when I, when I was talking to, I feel like that's not the case, but I'm not, I'm not 100% certain. You definitely, your arborist would know that though. Well, so far, those are the only questions. If anyone else has any questions, um, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, um, thank you, Larray. That was very interesting, and um, I'm sure people learned a lot. And for those that weren't able to make it tonight, it was great that you let us record it so that people can have it to reference. Yep. All right. Thank you.